say a word of thanks to Ken and Kim for giving me this opportunity to share God's Word. And I always consider it a privilege and an honor to share the Word of God because this is God's Word. And even if you read and if the listen to the passage of Scripture that was read, it says preach the Word. But uh, I'm going to focus this morning on chapter 3 from verses 14 to 17. Uh, there's a lot to unpack over there, hence I will not be moving in from chapter 4, 1 to 5, though we read it. <clears throat> Before I share God's word, can we look to the Lord in prayer? Father God, you speak into our hearts even as we open your word. May the written word become the living word, bearing fruit in our lives, that we will always learn to yield to the Holy Spirit. Bring alive your word, Lord, that we will learn to not only obey, but go forth and share your word. Share the good news of the gospel to the world that desperately needs you. Show it out in our own lives, Lord, by ministering to us even this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. The psalmist David said, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. This was said by a man who was called a man after God's own heart. On the cover of your Bible, and my Bible, appear the words, Holy Bible. Do you know why the Bible is called holy? Why should it be called holy when so much of lust and hate and greed and war are found in it? I can tell you why. It is because the Bible tells the truth. It tells the truth about God, about man, and about the devil. The Bible teaches that we exchange the truth of God for the devil's lie about sex, for example, and drugs, and alcohol, and religious hypocrisy. Jesus Christ is the ultimate truth. Furthermore, he told the truth. Jesus said that he was the truth, and the truth would make us free. I'm quoting Billy Graham in, in that uh, words which we just, uh, just spoke, spoke. When we first bought a new car from the dealer, the salesman explained the latest features in the car, and he also gave us the owner's manual along with the original invoice. And I distinctly remember him telling me, if you care for your vehicle, please read the owner's manual which outlines the service checkup due dates, and you will never go wrong. But I hardly ever got to read it, except when I had issues and problems, and I'm sure you would share the same thing. Well, our lives are a lot more complex than any automobile or appliance. And God, our designer and creator, has given us the owner's manual, which one theologian called it, God's love story. Do you know the Bible is the most popular book in the world? with the highest sales year upon year. Some say it's been sold, more than 3.9 billion copies have been sold over the last 50 years. But it's also popular for being the, the, the only book, actually calling the Bible a book is a misnomer because it's a collection of books, 66 books of the Bible. It has been popular for being assaulted all through these centuries and years gone by, and even in the recent past, and in the days to come. That's what scripture tells us. It's also the most powerful book, which has changed millions of people all around, down through the centuries, and even all through the world. It's changed my life. It's changed my family's life. It brought us as a family to God. Inasmuch, my dad led us to faith through his life, his lifestyle, 
Inasmuch two of my brothers became ministers because we sense that this was the precious word of God. It's also the most precious book. As the psalmist David said, it's more desirable, more precious than gold. Psalm 19, verse 10. How does God speak to us? Yes, he speaks to us through the word, but God also speaks to us through his creation. The psalmist David said in Psalm 19, 1 to 4, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour out speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. We see his beauty, his creativity, his power, his ingenuity, his knowledge, his organization, his purpose, his wisdom, his mercy, and grace. God also speaks through circumstances, sometimes supernatural. He spoke to Moses through the burning bush. He spoke to Balaam through his donkey. He spoke to Gideon through an angel. But in these recent days, God has spoken through his, pers through his son, the person of Jesus Christ, who is 100% human and 100% God in all scriptures, right from Genesis to Revelation, point to Jesus Christ. The Bible is called God's Word because it was authored by God. In other words, it's not a book that originates from the human mind, but from God. It is God breathed. In our passage that was read to us, we see that these are the last words spoken or written by the Apostle Paul. He was writing within weeks, perhaps even within days of his martyrdom. He begins in verse 14 stating, Timothy is protege and who has become convinced of the gospel through the instruction of three people. He says his beloved mother, Louise, his grandmother, Eunice, and his mentor, the Apostle Paul. Timothy's Hebrew mother and grandmother had educated him in the Old Testament scriptures. The Old Testament sometimes is a written off book. We don't tend to. It was a boring book for me before I came to faith in Jesus Christ. It was hard, it was difficult for me to understand. But it's only after I came to faith that God illuminated my mind and created an appetite for it. This is the Old Testament scriptures that Paul and Timothy read. This is the same scriptures that Jesus Christ had read, had lived, had loved. Therefore, Timothy had this enviable privilege of learning the gospel from both the lips and lives of these three people. Timothy's knowledge of scriptures from infancy formed a substantial ground and reason to continue the gospel. Therefore, the passage tells us, why should I and you believe the Bible? I have outlined four reasons. One, because all scripture, the word all, every word, right from Genesis to Revelation, is it the inspired word of God. Well, you may ask me, what do you mean when you say inspired? The Greek term refers to expiration. That means breath being breathed out as one speaks. When you speak and I speak, you feel your breath come out as the words are expressed. So Paul contends that when scripture was written, God was breathing out his word. Just as God breathed life into humanity at creation, so Paul says God breathed spiritual life into the scriptures so that we could be a new creation. I quote 2 Corinthians 5.17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Though we don't understand the process with our finite minds or, it's, uh, or understand how it came to be evolved in great detail as it is a mystery, yet we believe it by faith because God can never lie and this reflects his moral character. The apostle Peter writes in 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Hence we affirm that all scripture is God breathed. It originated in God's mind. It was communicated from God's mouth by God's breath. It's therefore rightly termed as the word of God, for God spoke it. 
Hence, we can say without a doubt, the Bible is inerrant and infallible word of God. It was written by 40 different authors, spread over 1,600 years, in three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, over a period of, as I said, 1,600 years. Amazingly, even with so many different authors, most of whom never knew each other, from completely different cultures, and writing from three different continents, they were poets, they were kings, they were doctors, they were farmers, they were shepherds, businessmen. There are many proofs to verify that the Bible is true, including a substantial number of historical archaeological discoveries that verify what the Bible teaches. Number two, the scripture informs, the scripture forms and transforms us into the image of God. Why you say this? He says, Paul says, all scriptures breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and training in righteousness. As I was mentioning in the earlier service, I come from a family of six brothers and four sisters, and I was always the black sheep in the family, and I always strayed away. I always did that which was wrong, and I earned the, the, uh, you know, the rot of my dad. I was spanked many a times, and when it says correction, I can reflect and say, yes, I had enough, and that's the reason why I'm standing here before you, because God used my dad to teach me and correct me in the way of righteousness. According to Paul, there are four things that Scripture does. All four are crucial for our spiritual lives. Scripture is profitable for teaching truth and refuting error. The apostle uses two pairs of words to flesh out the Scripture's usefulness. Number one, the first pair, teaching, rebuking. It has to do with doctrine. We get it wrong. We get it. We are, the Scriptures sometimes are twisted when, it, when, you, when you twist it out of context, it becomes, a con, it becomes a pretext for misinterpretation. Positively, all scripture are useful for teaching. That is why both the Old Testament and New Testament must be studied, not just the book of Romans or the Gospels. While well, in the process of teaching, rebuking is done. I remember when I became a Christian, I, I, I didn't understand so much of scripture in terms of even interpreting the scripture. And many a time, my brother, who was a minister, he used to teach me sometimes how scripture began to be formed and how do you need to interpret scripture. And it was sometimes a hard process. Sometimes I fell on my knees trying to understand how do I understand scripture. But it was worthwhile the effort because in studying God's word, you begin to, you, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a hardest process, but it's worthwhile because it begins to change your perspective, change your lifestyle, change your thought, your thinking. Teaching and rebuking produce the boon of sound doctrine. When this is missing, the church falls into error. Rebuking sounds like a negative word, but it's not. We need it. The Bible corrects heresy. It corrects our wrong understanding of God. It's like the poison label on a bottle of dangerous chemicals. It warns us against ingesting in beliefs that are harmful to our souls. The second pair is correcting and training in righteousness. And this has to do with our conduct. We are not just only hearers of the word, but we need to be doers of the word. And it has to touch our, 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 our lifestyle, the way we live. Correction is an act of offering an improvement to replace a mistake. This is a very practical term. Correction comes from the Greek word to straighten out. And I know what it means to be straightened out because I got straightened out with, with the rod. And as a result, we will grow in holiness and enjoy being a Christian rather than looking jaded, confused, or lacking the joy of a fruitful Christian. The third, pers the third message that comes to us in, is the centrality of its message. Paul tells us the gospel which I, tells Timothy, the gospel that which is able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Therefore, it begs the question to ask, what's the gospel? The gospel is the story of what God has already done for us. Other religions says you need to do so and so to get close to God. 
The gospel is the good news that God loves us just as we are, pities us and sees us in our hurt, our agony, our failure, and our weakness. And he has already done something about it through the death and resurrection of Jesus in that amazing series of events that came through the appearing of Jesus on earth. He broke the str stranglehold of evil upon human hearts. He found a way to set aside his own just sentence of death through those who opened their hearts to the Savior, including you and me. He has found a way not only to die for us, but to come and live in us and start the process of renewing us and remaking us and restoring us to our lost inheritance. Lastly, the, gospel, the, the word of God is profitable not only for the here and now, but also for eternity. Paul concludes by saying that the man of God, the woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The writer to Hebrew says the Bible is living, active, sharper, than, two, than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides, and it goes on to say that it's able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The result of all this is that you and I will not no longer be baby Christians. Can you imagine if you're a baby all through? So also in our spiritual lives, we need to grow up to be adults in our faith. But unfortunately, many Christians are baby Christians because we have not given time for studying the word, for shaping us and forming us into the image of God. The ultimate purpose of scripture is that our lives will become, will become men and women of sound faith, fully equipped by the power of the Holy Spirit to do every good work. In scripture, God gives us everything we need. The man of God is before all else, the man of the word, God is not content simply with us knowing our Bibles and our head knowledge. Even the devil knows the scriptures, but he wants us to incarnate its truths in our lives as well. Just as the Lord Jesus was made, was the word made flesh. With the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, we, you and me, can navigate through life's challenges as the Holy Spirit brings alive the word of God that has been deposited to us when we allow the scriptures to become part and parcel of our lives. In light of what we have heard, I remind you and my, I remind myself and you and all of us that the word of God is divinely inspired word of God. The word of God is profitable for teaching, for correction, and for training in righteousness. The word of God is the gospel that saves you and me from the eternal wrath of God. The word of God is profitable not only for the year and now, but also for eternity that we will be completely equipped for every good work. In light of what we have heard, I want to call you this morning to a fresh commitment to the word of God to be faithful every day in reading it, meditating upon it, obeying it, and treasuring it into your heart. Beyond that, I want to call you to a fresh commitment to Jesus Christ, the one to whom the scripture points to. The word of God is his story, his story of how he left heaven's glory to be born of a virgin, to live a perfect life among men, to die on the cross for your sin and my sin, and to rise from the dead and return to heaven and to reign and rule as the Lord and Savior in the life of everyone that comes to faith in him. What is your response? What is my response? Are we going to trust the word of God? It is God's love book. And when we allow ourselves to be shaped and molded by the word of God, then the life of Christ can live in each of us. Amen.